on that matter. And all of the other policy instruments that you see here, this is where the South African uh, food security mandate is hinging upon um, from the food security policy, from the household food and nutrition security strategy approved by cabinet, from the new growth path, uh, from the NDP, and the, the nutrition roadmap, and what we have now uh, been approved by cabinet lately, which is an agriculture policy action plan. And this is the background, which I'm going to rush through it very, very quickly, that it was approved in, in, in September 2013, gazetted in uh, August uh, 2014, together with the First Atlanta Food Production Initiative, and, and the history where this policy is coming from is starting from 2002, year 2000 where we had a, an integrated food security strategy for South Africa. And, and, and the, the experiences that we have learned in implementing that very same strategy has culminated us or government to come to this point where we develop this policy. So in other words, we have, we have looked into the evidence-based policy approaches and what we have implemented over time, what works, what doesn't work, and then it culminated down to what we have now as a policy of government moving forward and we are busy implementing it and the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group, which I think Mr. Tagavaraj was referring to in relation to the support to government, has already started developing the implementation plan for this very same policy. Last year, we had a Operation Pakisa. I think some of uh, individuals are aware of what government does in relation to the Pakisa. So we had a Food and Nutrition Security Pakisa workshop in Indaba Hotel. I see my colleague there who's a Dean um, of, of Sciences in UNISA. We were with them there. And some of the other colleagues who were here in the room to develop uh, the implementation plan. Because policy positions remain this broader statement of intent. You need then, therefore, to distill them down into programs, into actions that needs to be followed by resources in relation, both in relation to your human resource and your financial resources for you to implement. And also, adequately, the individuals at the ground, because we, we often talk at this level and forget that this is affecting individuals at the ground. They need to be capacitated. They need to have the skills for them to be able to, to feed themselves. And I think if you look into countries that have dealt with the issue of food security, policies um, and programs and strategies to some extent has met the capacity from the ground in relation to the, to the individuals that are the recipient and the users of those policies. So we're trying to do that as government. I think uh, what I'm going to share with you down the line of the other, the other initiative that we're engaged with. However, South Africa is not a highly agricultural productive country. I think if you, if, if you would look into it, um, we, we only have got 12% of the highest potential agricultural land. What does this mean? It means the land where you could plant and not be able to have your irrigation and other infrastructure that you will need to just plant. The agroclimatical conditions are favorable for, for, for cropping and other production uh, systems. And we have 22% which is suitable. Um, and the rest of, of the land we have is marginal. Now, here is, a, here is a tragedy, what we have. And yesterday, we were having Chinese um, uh, dele delegation uh, discussion with the India, India delegation and also, I think, um, from Zimbabwe and Kenya. It came very, very clear that in, in, in countries like China, we know the challenges they are faced with as far as food security is concerned. And the way they interpret their own food security strategies is economical. It's not physical food. And, and, and this is where you, 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 we learn a lot in, in as far as how do we have to, as South Africa, need to position ourselves. Now, what I'm, what I'm running into here is that in Pumalanga, for instance, we have lost big chunks of land into mining. And there was prime agricultural land. I'm talking about that very same 12% of high potential agricultural land is no longer 12% because mining is competing with agricultural land, particularly in Pumalanga. Now, in China, the land or agricultural land, you can't touch it. So in other words, there is laws that are saying don't touch agricultural land. For any developmental purposes, you could look for other land parcels, but not agricultural land. And, and I, think, I think it's an oxymoron in South Africa, of course, and we, wa we, are, we want to move into that direction with the, the work that we have started now of uh, having a Food Security Act that you, t you can't touch agricultural land. And, and, and in, in, in Pumalanga, a huge amount of land has been lost to mining. Uh, BFEP has actually stimulated to be uh, something like 20 26% of the prime agricultural land that has been lost to mining in Pumalanga. That was predominantly utilized to produce grains. And Grain SA, together with the department and the farmers, we needed now to find a new area where, we, where grains would be produced. Because, because the, the population, as what uh, Dr. Savagrach has said, is going up. The land in which the production is actually taking place is, is getting smaller because of the competing demands. Therefore, there is the need for technology and advancement of research for us to have better varieties, but also we needed to relocate 
the grain production in Pumalanga to other parts of the country, less we are going to be de dependent or solely dependent on imports. And we know when we're dependent on imports, international price volatility, they will come.